Dave and this is Logan out once again for a walk in the countryside. Thanks for joining us. Now today, as you can see, we're enjoying some beautiful sunshine on a beach. We're at Studland in Dorset. It's about two miles to the um, north of Swanage, about five and a half miles to the east of uh, Corf Castle. And today we're going to be doing a, a roughly four and a half mile circular route. We'll be having a quick look at the village of Studland itself, some World War II remains, a glorious beach, out to uh, old Harry Rocks, and we'll even see the start of the Purbeck Way. So there's a lot to see today. He's already had a charge up and down the beach. Now I'm filming uh, mid-April. Uh, there was a heavy frost this morning, but I'm glad to say the sun is out. There's no wind, so it should be perfect for walking. So do join us. Well, I've parked my car in the uh, South Beach National Trust car park. I think it's three pounds for two hours or five pounds all day. It's uh, right next to the, the pub. So before we head out onto the coastal path and the beach and what have you, I thought we'd have a, a little look around the village and we'll start off with the church, which is just behind me here. And here it is, the, uh, the church of St. Nicholas. The, uh, he was the patron saint of sailors. Anyway, this church was built in the 11th century or the early 12th century on the site of a, an earlier Saxon building which had been built in AD 690 and as you can see there's a nave with chancel under a central tower. The south porch was built in the 17th century but just looking at that central tower it was actually unfinished by the Normans owing to the, the danger of settlement but I love the louvered open openings on each side of the tower, although it does look as though it needs a top to it. I think it holds four bells. And this is just looking on the, the northern side in the shadow from the, from the sun. And there's a bit of masonry on the walls, which is Saxon, but everything else is Norman with some 18th century uh, replacement windows and restoration. And looking up, there's a little door right at the top where the roof ends and uh, it's only accessible by ladder. It may be a priest's room or a refuge room. Certainly it's unlikely to be a storeroom, I would have thought, if you needed a, a ladder. And just looking on the, uh, the south side where the porch is, just looking up underneath those eaves, you can see those call bells running under the eaves of the nave. It's on both the north and the south side. I think it's called a, a corbel table. Now they are a bit worn, but if you look closely, some are a little, should we say, risque? I mean, look at those two up there. Goodness knows what they're up to, I say. And just before we leave the church, there's one gravestone I want to show you just by the porch that of Sergeant William Lawrence of the 40th Regiment of Foot. Now the full history of his service is actually uh, almost put out on the, um, the gravestone itself, but he fought at the Battle of Waterloo on the 18th of June 1815. And in fact, he fought at nearly all of Wellington's key battles. He married a French lady and they ended up living here in the village running the pub. And her details are on the other side of the gravestone. I'm now going to just head north through the village, passing by the pub, by him here on the left, the Banks Arms. And it dates from the 1540s or 1549, I think, built from local quarried stone. And it was situated on an estate owned by the Banks family, who also owned Corf Castle and Kingston Lacey. The whole estate here at Studland Bay was actually gifted by Henry Banks to the National Trust in 1981. Anyway, the pub here was originally called the New Inn and from 1827 was under the stewardship of a local farmer called George Damon. And in 1844, William Lawrence, that's a chap who he saw his grave earlier on, he took on the tenancy, renamed it the Wellington Arms. In fact, many returning soldiers bought pubs with money received after leaving the army. And in the late 19th century, the pub changed its name to the Banks Arms Inn after the Banks family 
apparently in early 1900s it had three tennis courts uh, where the beer garden is um, situated over here on the, the right hand side. Uh, just before we head out onto Middle Beach, this is the pig on the beach. It was the old manor house. In fact, I think it used to be called the uh, the old, well called the Manor House Hotel in the past, now renamed Pig on the Beach. Uh, it's now leased from the National Trust, but it was built originally as a Gothic fantasy in 1825 by uh, George Banks. I think he had something like 14 children. Oh, I love the, the pig outside the door there. Well, there's a handy little map here. So uh, there's the, the church and the pub. So we've, we've just walked down here. We're obviously here. We'll have a just look down onto the middle beach, but we're going to then walk back, have a bit of fun along the south beach and then head up towards old Harry Rocks there. And just see here, we've got the naturist area. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's a little bit too cold, so I doubt that's going to be very busy today. <laughs> and this is just looking out across the, the middle beach. Already a few people out and about. Again, that's looking uh, north. Beautiful sandy beaches over in the far distance there. Well, it really is quite glorious. I didn't need my jacket today, I should have left that in the car. Now Studland, uh, the name means um, basically land where horses are kept. It's not very big, population of about 425. In fact a lot of the houses in the village are uh, second homes or holiday homes or guest houses, so the population does vary. And I was reading somewhere that uh, you remember Mr. Plod, the policeman, and the Enid Blyton Noddy stories, where well, he was based on a, an actual policeman that was living in the village in the 1940s. Apparently Enid Blyton used to come here quite a bit. Right, now we've got some exploring to do. Let's go and have a look. Well, how about this for a, a World War II structure? I'm right by Fort Henry. And as you can see, it certainly is quite impressive. Built in 1943, it's an observation bunker. There's also a gun emplacement here around the side. But uh, the bunker itself is 90 foot long. The walls and ceilings are three foot thick with, uh, as you can see, an observation slit. And it was the largest observation post to be built in Britain. And it got its name from the home base in Ontario of the Canadian Royal Engineers who actually built it. We might ask the question, why did they build it here? Well, if we look out over across to the north, it uh, becomes painfully more obvious. You can see that, well, firstly the beach here it would have been an ideal landing ground for the Germans. There are in fact some dragon's teeth down there behind the, uh, the foliage. But it was um, used for training troops for the D-Day landings as well because the beach down there is very, very similar to, to Normandy. Right, well, there's a little entrance so it looks as though you can go in. Right, now it could get a little bit dark in here. Well, I don't know, it's not too bad. I'm pleased to say there's not too much graffiti in here. So now, can you see through that little slit there? And this is just uh, one part of it as well. Well, hopefully you can see us in here. Might be a bit echoey. I have got a little light on the camera. Now, back in, well, about six weeks before uh, D-Day, Winston Churchill was actually in this bunker along with Dwight Eisenhower, and King George VI, and they actually witness one of the biggest uh, live ammunition practices uh, in the, uh, the Second World War. But unfortunately, there was it was a scene of a, a tragedy. Uh, they did a lot of training here for the amphibian tanks, and in a particular, 
I think it was in April 1944, seven Valentine tanks with the duplex drive equipment that made them amphibious sank out here in the bay and it resulted in the death of six crew members. And I believe there are still some tanks out there in the bay. Right, <laughs> I think Logan wants to get down. I'll just stop for a second top of the cliff just to look at the view. We've got the South Beach down there which we'll be having a look shortly. I'm aware that the sun is still quite low this time of year so we'll give this a go. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I see there's a few cruise liners out there of course with them COVID-19 a lot of uh, the cruise liner industry has come to a halt so um, there's a few of these parked out there at the moment and then just turning around that's old Harry Rocks in the far distance where we'll be uh, paying a visit eventually and then if I just pan round now that far ridge the very very top that's where we'll be heading eventually before we head back into the village well we're now on the south beach dogs are allowed on the beach uh, it's just between, I think it's the 1st of May and the 30th of September. They have to be on a, a lead of at least two metres long. But seeing as I'm filming middle of April and there's sand here, it's time for some Whippet Zoomies. Look at this uh, red sand on the cliff here. The various stratas up there. Beautiful. And just coming across towards the end of the beach, we've got this rather <laughs> oh, sad looking pillbox that uh, looks like it's fallen down the cliff. And, now into the sea and just panning over again look at the various carvings and graffiti over the years gradually getting worn away by the sea I expect okay let's have a look at this little sweet little pillbox <laughs> I mean I guess at one stage it was in the ideal position looking out to uh, to see I guess that must be the the entrance there that's a slightly uh, slightly bigger hole to get in I tell you it's quite glorious out here today the sea is almost looking quite blue now made our way out of the village and I'm going to follow the coastal path southwards to Harry Rocks. Oh look at this just by me on the left hand side you've got the quite exquisite yellow colour of the gorse and the golden sunshine and then just behind it uh, is that blackthorn? I haven't got my glasses on. <laughs> anyway 
we're now going to head in that direction over there. <laughs> Well, we've made it to old Harry Rocks. Now, I'm not going to get any closer to the edge. Logan is on a tight lead. <laughs> so, let me show you what we've got here. I say we are at the, uh, well, the most easterly end of the Jurassic Coast. And it's basically three chalk formations as a stack and a stump. It used to be part of a, a long stretch of chalk between the Purbeck Peninsula and the Isle of Wight. Well, it's very hazy out there. I can just about make out the needles of the Isle of Wight. So let me tell you a bit about it. I mean, Old Harry, that's the stack furthest out. And then Old Harry's wife, which I can't quite see, it's around the uh, side there. It's a much smaller stack. In fact, I think it crumbled into the sea in 1896. There's only a small bit of it left. The outcrop of land next to Old Harry is called No Man's Land and then the gap between uh, the mainland and no man's land is called St Lucas's Leap. Now there are all sorts of legends behind the name of the rocks, uh, possibly named after the devil who used to sleep out there. The devil was often known as Harry. Or version number two is it's named after a, a well-known pirate, Harry Pay, uh, back in the 1400s used to keep his ship behind the rocks here and they used to dash out and uh, uh, plunder merchant seamen. Another version is it uh, it's named after a 9th century Viking called Harold that uh, died here or drowned out here during a Viking raid. The St Lucas Leap bit, well that's named after a greyhound uh, that uh, leapt to its death chasing a rabbit here. Although another story was that there were two uh, greyhounds coursing a hare and one of them was called Lucas, which seems an odd name for a dog, but there you go. Now, I did come here a couple of weeks ago on my own without Logan and did some artistic shots over the cliff using the, a pole with my camera. So if you're not that great with heights, you might want to look away now. Just uh, making our way sort of westwards, but you get a great view actually from Old Harry just a little bit further along. It really is quite a glorious day, just slowly panning round, sun glinting off the sea, and then this is just looking west. And over there is the, uh, I think it's called Old Nick's Ground again, another name for the devil. And the uh, two little stacks there, the pointed one is called the Pinnacle and the slightly fatter one in front is called Haystack. Right, I think it's time to get a bit closer to the mainland. Well, I'm quite pleased I'm away from that edge now. <laughs> so we're making our way westwards towards Ballard Down. A few more people out and about now. Well, it is a glorious uh, spring day. It's understandable, I guess. And we're just about to uh, start on the Purbeck Way, which is a, I think it's a 28 mile long distance path that makes its way to Wareham eventually. Of course, we're also on the south um, coast path that uh, starts at Poole and works its way along the coast around 
Devon, Cornwall, all the way to Minehead in Somerset, I think, something like 630 miles. But it is so some cracking views. If I just well if I pan round to the to the north, um, well we'll get some better views later on once we're a little bit higher, but uh, again you've got these beautiful rolling hills and then just turning round slowly we've got the sea out on our left hand side beautiful uh -huh. a trig point usually a sign that we're pretty high up and indeed we are up at uh, I think this is the one of the highest points of Ballard Down well, it's beginning to look a little cloudy over inland I'm afraid I think we might have had the best of the day and just panning round here that is uh, Swanwich in all its glory a little bit hazy now but you can still make out the um, the beaches very popular in the summer of course as a holiday uh, destination okay well we're going to continue with our westwards journey we hey well, as regular viewers will know, I do love coming across boundary stones, and we've got one here. Studland Manor, 1776, I think. And I'm guessing Swanage Parish must have been on the other side. Now, this little spot here seems higher than that trig point, but let's have a. I know sometimes views don't always come across that well on a a GoPro but hopefully this gives you a an idea as I just pan around on all those little rather expensive yachts and in, in the bay there and that's looking over very far distance that must be Southampton and then this is Pool. It really does um, show how large Pool Harbour is and then there's Studland itself down in the, the valley there and oh it looks a bit uh, looks a bit dark over <laughs> to the north I think they've got some rain at the moment I think we've been quite lucky now this uh, lump of stone here marks our most westerly point of the walk we're going to start heading um, uh, north back into the village I say lump of stone it's actually a seat uh, installed here by the goodwill of a David Jardin who was a Bow Street magistrate who visited Swanage and I see just on the side here I can just about make out the inscription DJ 1852 right as I said we're going to uh, head now northwards or downhill if you're feeling energetic uh, you could carry on for another uh, half a mile if if that actually further along the ridge to explore the obelisk now uh, that commemorates the provision of the, the new supply of drinking water for Swanage in 1883 and the structure was originally erected in London I think but uh, it was moved and brought here by George Burt in 1892 some nine years after the water supply was installed. It was actually taken down in 1941 as it was a landmark that would have aided the Germans in the Second World War and it was re-erected in 1973 by men of the uh, 129 East Riding Field Squadron Royal Engineers Volunteers. <laughs> well very much on the homeward leg now heading back downhill into the, the village and as I do so on my left there's this little block of houses called the Glebeland Estate and it's got a, well, a fascinating little bit of history that I was reading. It was built in the 1930s on uh, land that used to be owned by the church uh, and there was some, well, the local big estate landowners, the Banks family, wanted to buy it at auction but on the day of the auction their agent missed the train and so couldn't bid and as a result the land was sold to developers <laughs> but what great views they've got from their verandas looking across the bay wonderful well, I just about made it back to the uh, the village 
and we're going to stay dry um, just behind um, the manor farm which is to my uh, left here beautiful building and then panning around you probably just caught sight of this cross here that was erected in 1976 but it was put on top of an old uh, base of a Saxon cross and then look at that lovely uh, little thatched barn to the side here right back to the car park well folks we've come to the end of our walk we hope you enjoyed it if you did please give us a thumbs up and a like and uh, do make a comment and as I always say, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Hopefully uh, that way you'll be able to join us for another walk sometime in the future. Well, we've had a super walk today. Some of the views along the, uh, the, the cliff tops were quite extraordinary. And a few other interesting things we saw as well. You quite liked it in that uh, observation post, I think. <laughs> well, until we meet again, thanks for watching and cheerio.